Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A couple of days ago, my local next door mailing list got filled with images of a meteorite or something falling back from the sky. Now, look, Nextdoor's local community has a wide range of skill sets. Generally, people don't know the difference between meteorites and space debris or, like, spiders flying around in the sky. Wait, spiders flying in the sky? Well, yes, one of the responses was to a piece of video showing mysterious lights floating around in the middle of the day, which we very quickly figured out was actually spiders ballooning on their uh, silk. Yes, in California, we have spiders which fly. Anyway, even with the text-only descriptions that I initially saw, it was pretty obvious to me that this was almost certainly going to be a satellite burning up. Question was, which one? And when you're dealing with satellites re-entering over populated areas and freaking people out, the first guess is Starlink. Not because that Starlink likes to freak people out, but because there are more Starlink satellites than almost anything else. So statistically, Starlink is the best bet. But in this case, the best candidate was Starlink number 1586, launched back in 2020, and thanks to Dylan for that. And so given that the orbital elements track back to this object, we have a specific identification. But in general, it's good to know the difference between a meteorite and a satellite re-entering so that you can look at an object and quickly understand the difference. And the rule of thumb is that meteors, when they come down, they flare up very, very quickly and disappear, whereas satellites, they can move across the sky for, you know, a couple of minutes. In both cases, the objects are burning up about 50 miles up in the atmosphere, and the human visual system has a hard time handling this. They'll see the object fly overhead and disappear over the horizon, and assume that it landed over the hill next door to them. In fact, there was an incident a couple of years ago where a meteorite flew over California, and coincidentally, some people who saw it driving in a car found a burning house further down the road, and they naturally thought this meteorite must have caused the fire. When meteor trackers triangulated all the observations from around California, they realized that the meteor came down over a hundred miles north of where the fire started. I made a whole video explaining this and uh, yeah, people still believe that the meteorite caused the fire. So what is the basis for the rule of thumb that says meteorites burn up quickly, whereas space debris burns up slowly? Is there something structurally different? I mean, obviously, space debris is man-made, right? Therefore, it might be more robust against burning up. Well, that's not it. Meteorites can come in a range of styles. We've seen a rubble pile asteroids with a material that is literally just fragmenting as you touch it. Meanwhile, at the other end of the scale, you can have meteorites, which are solid chunks of iron that just punch through the atmosphere. In spacecraft, we've seen entry vehicles which are designed to handle the rigors of re-entry and fly all the way down to the surface in one piece, whereas people building satellites generally believe that it's a good idea to make them out of demisable materials. That is, when they go through the atmosphere, they will burn up into tiny, tiny pieces and therefore not fall onto the ground and cause impact damage. Is it simply a speed thing, right? Is it that things which fall from deep space are moving faster than the satellites that are in low Earth orbit? Well, this is absolutely correct that these two things are somewhat related, but it's not the whole story. Yes, meteorites have to come from deep space, therefore Earth's gravity accelerates them all the way down, and the minimum energy of a meteorite is more than twice that of a spacecraft in low Earth orbit. But we have seen examples of meteorites which were moving very quickly but were able to be tracked for a long period of time by people on the ground. Meanwhile, we've seen slow-moving sounding rockets come down and produce very short trails. No, the real difference is not speed, it's velocity. And that can be a hard thing for people to parse if you're not like a mathematician or a physicist. The whole thing is that speed is just how fast you're going. Velocity is how fast you're going and what direction you're going. It all comes down to the angle with which an object hits the atmosphere. If it comes in at a steep angle, then it's going to go down through thicker and thicker layers of the atmosphere, and the dynamic forces will build up very quickly, and it will burn up or slow down much more quickly. Whereas, if an object comes in at a very low angle, it will remain in the upper atmosphere, experiencing just enough drag to put on an awesome show, but not so much that it falls down into the thicker parts of the atmosphere too quickly and destroys itself. And so the nature of satellites in orbit around the Earth means that they are much more likely to come in at a much lower angle and therefore have produced trails which last a whole lot longer. Whereas 
meteorites, when they're coming from deep space, when they hit the Earth, the average angle of descent is 45 degrees. So an object coming from deep space and hitting the Earth's atmosphere at a 45 degree angle is descending relative to the surface at about 10 kilometers per second, which means the atmospheric density it's experiencing is increasing by a factor of three to four every second. And so the object either reaches a situation where the dynamic forces destroy it, or it hits the Earth and gets destroyed. So now, what controls the angle of descent in both these cases? Well, if you've got a satellite in orbit around the Earth, and it's dead, right? It's a piece of space debris, it's coming down slowly. It's experiencing a small amount of drag from the very tenuous upper atmosphere, so it begins to descend down. Now, the amount of drag that it experiences at any point in the orbit depends upon the thickness of the atmosphere, and the density of the atmosphere depends on the altitude. So the satellites experience more drag when they are at their perigee, when they are closest to the Earth. And that means that if you've got an eccentric satellite orbit, then the drag at the perigee is greater, therefore the point furthest from the orbit comes down faster. And so satellites experiencing drag in orbit will tend to produce more circular orbits over time as they descend. That means that when they finally reach the point of no return, they are going essentially horizontal, parallel to the surface of the Earth. And so the buildup of the heating is very, very gradual. In fact, they're probably experiencing atmospheric heating multiple orbits beforehand. We've seen uh, starships onboard cameras show the plasma buildup at like much higher altitudes than we would expect to see it on the ground. Now, Starship's an interesting case because it's actually coming down at a steeper angle than most satellites because it's intentionally suborbital. But of course, Starship has wings and control surfaces, so it's able to flatten out its trajectory and control its descent so that it can make it through the atmosphere and land exactly on target. If you want to see an example of a human-made piece of debris descending through the atmosphere at a steep angle, that tends to come from ballistic missiles. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen videos of ballistic missile attacks in various parts of the world. They tend to be relatively short range attacks, but there's some um, video out from like the Kwajalein test range in the Pacific where the US launches uh, ICBMs. Those are basically moving at orbital velocity, but they're coming down at a much steeper angle because that's actually more efficient. These warheads are, of course, designed to handle the intense re-entry conditions experienced during this descent. They are not, however, tough enough to handle the more intense activation of their physics packages. So anyway, now looking at the meteorites. They're coming in essentially from deep space, and they are just going in a straight line. The Earth just happens to be in their way. Therefore, their descent angle is effectively random, but it's not a linear distribution from zero degrees up to like 90 degrees. The distribution is like a hump with uh, zero degrees and 90 degrees having zero probability and 45 degrees in the middle having the largest probability. And you know, you might naively think that the Earth's gravity should have some contribution to this distribution, that uh, Earth's gravity should cause the objects to arc over and descend at a steeper angle with a higher rate. Well, it turns out that's not the case. What the gravity does actually do is increase the a number of objects that finally hit the Earth, but it doesn't modify the distribution of angles. So the vast majority of meteorites are going to come down with a steep enough angle that they experience rapidly increasing dynamic pressure and break up very, very quickly. But not all of them. There's a famous meteorite in 1992, the Peekskill meteorite, which were observed by a number of people over the east of uh, North America. And we actually have a few videos from it. This was people which were at other events like baseball games or music performances. They saw the meteor flying past and they pointed the camera at it. This meteorite was also exceptionally famous because uh, it continued downrange and eventually a fragment of it hit a car, a 1980 Chevy Malibu, which had apparently been recently purchased for $300. And while you think that might be bad luck for the new owner, she actually sold it to a collector of meteorites for $25,000 and the car has been displayed at various museums around the world. But coming back to that footage, you can very easily see the chunks coming off of that because it lasts for such a long time. And again, it isn't because the meteorite is any tougher or weaker than the satellites. It's really down to the amount of time that people are able to track it. So if this had happened today and I'd seen videos like this on social media, and I watched the meteor tracked for several seconds, 
I would actually assume that it was a piece of space debris because of the amount of time, the low angle of attack, but this was just a very rare meteorite. Now, there is one other uh, distinguishing factor, which yeah, doesn't apply in this case, but meteorites can pretty much come from almost any direction, whereas the majority of pieces of space debris will be going from the west to the east because that most satellites orbit the Earth in that direction. There are a few that opposite, uh, orbit in other directions. There's a few that go in polar orbits, but it's very rare to find a meteor or sorry a satellite which deorbits from east to west now interestingly while meteors can pretty much come down over every part of the globe uh, meteor showers they have to come from a specific point in the sky now normally we identify meteor showers on the calendar by the date ranges in which they happen but the reason we know that these are meteor showers with a common origin is when you look at where they come from in the sky they all seem to come from a specific point that's why the leonids come from the constellation of leo, leo. that's where they got their name this is typically caused by something like a comet which has been kicking out space dust and debris as it orbits around the sun and this debris follows the elliptical orbit and so when the earth passes through it it sees a you know increase in the number of meteors coming from along that orbit it's in the same place in the sky roughly at the same time of the year so to summarize if you're able to see it for more than like 10 seconds if you have enough time to pull out your phone and take a photo it's probably a piece of space debris coming back from low Earth orbit. If it comes and it goes in a fraction, in a few seconds, uh, it's much more likely to be a meteorite. If it is traveling from the west to the east, it's probably a satellite. If it's going in other directions, it could well be a meteorite. And finally, in both these cases, they're also a very long way away. Just because it disappears over that hill next to you doesn't mean that it landed just over that hill. It's very likely going hundreds of miles away. Unless you see it land, you don't know where it landed. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.